My name is Doug Smith. Appreciate you guys coming down. Um, hi. Uh, hi. Um, welcome to the space. A buddy of mine owns a building. I've been down here for like four or five years. All this has mainly been storage for me and my company, the rental house. But just within the last couple of months, I've opened this up and wanted to use it again. Uh, within the next month or two, I'll have all this stuff cleared out of here. And then that'll be for still life. So my background is stills, as you can kind of see with all this stuff here. Uh, I started out doing celluloid printing and shooting film, good God, almost 30 years ago. And then made the transition into, into motion about 20 years ago and kind of never looked back from there. Um, throughout the past, I guess, like 15 years, I've been a gaffer. You guys, I guess, are curious of that position, so I'm here to kind of explain it to you. With me tonight, we have Trinity Greer. He's going to help us out. He's an experienced filmmaker, has been doing this. There, talk about yourself. Uh, I've been working in film for 20 years. Uh, I've worked uh, in every position in every capacity on film sets for documentaries, narrative, reality TV, uh, you know, one-man band documentary running up stairs with all the gear and setting up and running crews of 25 people. So uh, I have a lot of varied experiences. And one thing about our market is you have to wear many hats. I mean, you're lucky if you can just DP. You're lucky if you can just AC. And, um, you have to, or at least for me and my generation, we were brought up doing everything. I'm used to being a one-man band, doing audio acquisition, uh, lights, camera, everything. We're, used, we're just used to doing it. So it's kind of made us, um, I don't know, I guess utilitarian and industrial, but... Yeah. But Every day also, is a hustle when you're, when you're trying to make money through art, right? Yeah. Commercial, commercial art production means you got to be a, a jack of all trades in a small market. Because you're just not going to get the, the concentration to do the job that you only want to do in a small market. Possible. But How many of y'all went to the, the grip class? Yeah, so y'all are kind of familiar with the equipment? Yeah, well, we'll have a little tutorial towards the end of the night so you guys can kind of play around with it. More than anything else, we're just going to get into the world of lighting. So um, everyone I'm guessing here has curiosity or has been on film sets, correct? Yeah? Um, fantastic. So you all know the hierarchy. I don't need to go through all of that. Yeah? Cell phone went off on set. You all know the rule. He buys the first round next time. That's, that's the unwritten rule, man. Yeah? That's the unwritten rule on set. That's the unwritten rule. Um, I don't need to explain the hierarchy, but I'll explain the role of a gaffer. A uh, gaffer works in conjunction with the DPs and the directors to feel, to set up the overall feel uh, from a lighting standpoint, as well as make sure that all of the lighting and lighting distribution is done in a timely and financially responsible manner. Um, safety is of utmost importance to anyone that's on set, but also to every gaffer. They're in charge of all the electric equipment, all the electrical equipment, and all the electrics, the juicers, Sparkies, whatever you want to call them, and then also partially responsible for the key grip and all of the grip department as well. Or at least that's how it is in the, in the line of work that I do and a lot of the reality shows that I've worked on. Um, you're kind of responsible for everything that's not the camera department. Hey, guys, welcome. Come on in. There's, uh, do you all need another chair? We just, you didn't miss much. We're just, we just started talking about lighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of, sorry, I'll, I'll try and speak up a little bit more. Um, so from a gaffing standpoint, it is, for me, it's paramount to have safety first. What's, what's the old rule with Fess? Fess would always joke around safety third. You all yeah. know Fess? Yeah? He'd always joke around safety third, but no, it's always first. And so that's just paramount to me. So we'll get into the history of gaffers. The term comes from an old, it's old British slang for a, like a gaff pole. A gaff pole is a, a, a rod that had a hook on the end that stagehands used to change lights. A lot of people think it's derivative from uh, like a fishing crew. You know, you have a crew, you have a, you know, your gaffer and this, that, and the other, your mates, all that kind of stuff. But uh, the term comes from that, from a hook, a pole to, to work with stage lights. Um, and then it's just kind of gone down, gone down from there. Um, I think for me, working in reality television and any commercial set, the key for any gaffer, a successful gaffer, is to make it look like it's not lit. You want it to look as organic as possible. 
you want to walk into a situation, turn the lights off, if there are lights, turn the lights off, figure out what ambient light is coming in, and then figure out if you have to work with or against it. Then you turn your lights back on if you're going to go that route. You bring in your heads, you set up your key, your backlight, fill, whatever you want to go from there. But it's a lot of problem solving, and a lot of times, especially if it's commercial work, you have to do it on set without any kind of, um, any kind of forewarning. There's a lot of surprises. The beauty about narrative and movies is you have an opportunity to kind of go beforehand in pre-production, go and visit the site, kind of troubleshoot and figure out what tools you'll need to make everything successful. So um, that's kind of, I guess, the, the basis of the job in a nutshell. Now we'll just, I guess, get into lighting. Any questions up to this point? 90% of my job is kissing ass with the director <laughs> and, and making sure that he or she knows what they're doing um, mm -hmm. and just and trying to make sure that the DP tells me. There's a, open lines of communication are paramount on set. If your director doesn't talk to your your DP and tell them exactly what they want, um, it's, it's, it, it, it goes south fast. You know, your, your DP really needs to understand the equipment, the limitations of equipment, and also need to understand the limitations in, of your gaffer as well. Um, so I think, the, for me, 90% of what I do is figure out, especially if it's a new DP or director I work with, it's figuring out how they light. A lot of people are big light in the back, little light in the front. You know, a lot of people are big light in the front, little light in the back. You have to figure out what makes them happy so that you can continue to move and work towards that wrap time, you know? So I, I think as a gaffer, you have to want to appease the director and the DP and make sure that they gather the visuals that they want with the color theme and color palette that they want. But more than anything else, you just have to do it in a fastidious manner, and you really have to know what you're doing, you know? You want to add anything on that? Yeah, as a DP that hires gaffers, what I'm always looking for is someone that is going to bring a solution to my problem. You know, So my job as a DP, I'm going in, I'm looking at the light, I'm looking at the way the room's going to be organized, where I'm going to place my subject. I'm already starting to think of, all right, I need the camera here because I'm going to need to arrange space. I want the gaffer to always be aware of Electrical loads, they're putting on housing circuits. That's primarily uh, a lot of small market work is you're working in people's homes. Are you going to overload and blow a breaker in the middle of the shot? Um, do you need a Jenny? Do you need, if you're going to run a putt-putt, do you know how far away it needs to be? Putt-putt is a small generator for those that are unaware. Um, if you're going to run a big generator, where is that going to go so that you can run the more powerful lights? Um, I look to the gaffer to solve all the mathematical problems of running the lighting. And then all I'm focusing on is the artistic part of how I'm going to carve up my scene with light. Where am I blocking? Where am I putting my subjects? Where am I putting my camera? Is my camera walking through the space? Those are the things I'm thinking about. So I don't want to be thinking about, is there 20 amps on that circuit and is there 40 amps on that circuit. Do we need to tie into the street electrical panel to, to power these things? Um, you know, all, the, all that I want to leave to my gaffer. Um, yeah, so the last thing they want to worry about is hair and makeup putting on a flick in a hair dryer and it blows out half of a house. Right. You know, and then everyone's in a scramble trying to figure out what happened. Because Lord knows that's happened a gazillion times on set. And inevitably, <clears throat> I as a DP may get a little bit excited about certain gear. Like, oh, God, I really want to see this light play on set, you know, because I'm curious about it. I don't own it, you know, so I might rent it. I'm, I'm trusting the gaffer to go, yeah, I mean, that's a cool light source, but I don't think you need to run an HDMI, HMI on this particular set. I, would, I think it would, makes more sense if you run an LED, right? So the gaffer's going to be the one that stops me from spending money that I don't need to spend because he knows better about what the light heads offer. That's, that's an important thing to remember is just because you see a piece of gear or, you know, uh, you were on a big budget project and they had RE sky panels for everything doesn't mean that that's what you need for your set. You know, sometimes what you need is uh, a nice practical on a, on a fader and your gaffer is going to be the one to tell you the difference between one thing or another. So. The, huh? 
So a practical would be a light fixture like um, anything in camera that in is camera. also a light. That is called a practical light. So it'd be the, like L a desk lamp. the LEDs up top. Those are all practicals. So from a gaffer standpoint, to make this room more natural, to make it to light it for essentially a production, I would come in and well, these housings are old and antiquated, but I would take like Kino tubes, CFL tubes, or LED tubes, uh, the T4Cs, stuff like this. They have ran T4Cs. You take tubes like these, things that you can control. Because ultimately what a gaffer needs more than anything else is control. So you would take sources like this, if it decides to come on. I got an air gap there. You would take a source like this, you would zip tie it to the ceiling inside the fixture so you would have creative control over all of the light. Uh, say you had an incandescent lamp over there. They have tubes, or excuse me, they have bulbs that you can throw in there so you can control the overall color temperature as well. It's ultimately about controlling anything that has light within the room. Yeah, so appliances are things that you add to set. Practicals are things that are typically there. Normally, on a major project, like a TV show or something like that, you probably are working primarily with practicals in set, and you have pre-built-in lighting that you've worked in with your art director into your set locations. So that's the way most modern films get done, is they build it into the set locations. Um, but most of us are not going to be living on that kind of budget, right? You, most of us are probably not going to get access to a soundstage with a completely open roof for us to be able to do mounted, uh, grid mounted lighting like a studio production. Um, I mean, it, it's a trip going from, well, I'm going to set up some lights in this one room to going to a full studio production, to then going to an on-location uh, film project, the techniques that you use in each one of those situations is vastly different. You, you, you solve problems in a very different way when you're on a set, when you're on a studio set, or when you're just trying to get an image to expose because you're figuring out how to do a 48-hour film festival. Those are all very different situations. But light's light. You know, it's just how, whether or not you have to deal with a high ceiling or a low ceiling makes a difference. What kind of light's coming in the room? You got to yeah. deal with those situations as well. Um, the last reality show I worked on, the, the biggest hurdle for me was trying to make all the practicals work in scene. So we incorporated a lot, worked with our department, we incorporated a lot of lamps. Uh, they had fluorescent fixtures pulled in there, so we, they put the fixtures in. I added my tube so I could control everything. Um, when they had um, any kind of uh, interior, exterior switch, if they were following the, the talent in or outside in daylight, I had to make sure that the color temperatures are roughly the same. Because do you all know anything about color temperatures with tungsten and all that stuff? Have you all, did they talk about that? So daylight is a different color temperature than tungsten and incandescent light, all that stuff. You all know all that? Yeah? I don't need to get into that. All right, cool beans. So I had to make sure that the interior of the house was lit the same way the exterior of the house was. So all the lighting fixtures in the barns had to be daylight, unless we colored them up like this, that kind of stuff. Or if we wanted to warm them up with tungsten, we had that opportunity. But a lot of it is just troubleshooting so that it's easier for the camera department so they can work on what's most important to them, which is the blocking and the actual gathering of imagery and information. Yeah. Any questions up to this point? No? Huh? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's circumstantial only because I personally like doing a lot of one shots. So I like to get my camera blocking and, and that kind of squared away. And then normally I come in and light uh, so that we know where the light apparent, where we can hide a light. Um, uh, and then when you start doing reality TV, it's, it's less about that and more just about like, how can I cleanly, uh, do what I need in this room? And it's, it's, I set the camera cause I want to, I know where I'm going to put my person. And then I start lighting around the, the monitor on that. But 
it depends, it's horses for courses. Uh, narrative projects, everything has meaning, or at least in my narrative projects, everything has meaning. So I like to have a very sculpted light approach. Um, and so that means I'm deciding where the camera's gonna go, where the blocking's gonna go, then we light, and then we come in and, and start refining from there. Um, that's just my approach. You know, others, just depends on the size of the crew, right? If it's me and a grip swing and a gaffer, my approach to getting things set up is like, let's get all the appliances in, get the stands pre-built, start popping heads on things, and then let's start figuring out how we're gonna cut up the room. If I have a crew and I have a job to do that is not there to, to drive them, then I'm doing lighting diagrams and things like that, and my role is more preparatory so that they get in and they do their work so that when I show up with the director to start blocking and shooting, I've already kind of, that, that base palette is already laid down, and then all I'm asking for from crew is, I need a cut over here, or I, need, I need a flag over here, I need a courtesy to keep, to keep the heat off the camera because cameras now seem to all overheat. You know, like, you. It's a different list of problems to solve, and the amount of work that you do is less about in the moment and more prep preparation. Um, so that's the difference. It, it, it just depends on you know, taking advantage of the situation. You know, if you've worked news, then you understand. You you work with the scene you walk into, and you uh, you know zoom in and keep the head big and and fat so you cover up everything else you don't want to see. You know, but uh, I like to do a lot of wide shots, so that never works out for me. <laughs> Some of the roles in the electrical department. So underneath Gaffer, you have your best boy electric. He is in charge of all heads and fixtures and all power distribution. If you're running generators outside, generators wherever you are on set, your best boy is going to be in charge of all of that. He's also in charge of keeping time cards, start paperwork, and all that stuff. Goes through him or her. And then that's delegated to the rest of the juicers from that, from that standpoint as well. Um, in tandem with the Best Boy Electric, you also have a key grip. Your key grip is the one that's going to be doing all the modifiers and all the camera mounts, be it either dollies, uh, Dana dollies. You saw the dolly track when you first walked in. Dolly track, jibs, all of that. They're more camera support and rigging. So if you're working on, anyone do theater work? Yeah? There you go. So you, there's a lot of rigging in theater work. Uh, you got to build trusses. You have safety lines. You got, I mean, there's a myriad of things you can do in that. There's a lot of grip work. Um, and then under your key grip, you have various other grips. Um, that's just that's pretty yeah, much. Yeah, dolly it. grips. You have depends on where you are. Where rigging you are on grips and and how much budget and time and those kind of things. Yeah, the DP is the department head for camera and for lighting. Right? So the gaffer works immediately for the DP. Um, and then your camera department works for the DP, your first AC, second AC, camera operator, if it's not one of the ACs or it's not the DP. Um, and then you have your DITs, which fall under the editing side of the house. But when they're on set, they fall under the DP. Um, uh, although I don't yeah, know they, what the latest. They kind of work. They work in tandem with the with the AC, switching cards, making yeah, all the editing and color correction on set. Yeah, technically they are considered <clears throat> third AC. East. Yeah, if we if we say anything you guys don't understand, by all means raise your hand and we'll we'll ask you about it. We'll tell you about it. Yeah, uh, I mean it's just like being in the military. Being on a film set, you have a lot of acronyms so that you can communicate quickly. Yeah, exactly. Everything has a weird name, and it's wild because it's geographical. Um, like in Atlanta, they call you know quackers. They call them oinky boinks. Uh, Chicago. I mean, everyone has their own little. All these a little gobo filters. in one place is a uh, what? What do you call yeah, them? These here? are cookies over in, yeah. on the East Coast. This is a two point five grip head. That's technically the name of it here. We call them gobos. Yeah, they people call them different things. See, and I know of a gobo is the same thing as a cook as a kookalorus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. This this is a this is another gobo. This is a gobo. 
and that is a gobo. You just I mean, I just call this knuckles and arms. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that uh, and oh, by the way, if someone says, can you grab a butt plug, do not reach down your pants and pull one out. They're actually, it's a, it's an abutting plug that goes into a receiver. It's a junior receiver with a, a male five eights or baby pen on. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of things that sound <laughs> filthy, but uh, you know, they're just, they're just piece of equipment. <laughs> so don't feel sexually harassed. No. <laughs> unless you're sexually harassed. Go ahead. Well, for them, the, the last thing a, a DP wants to do walking inside is to change white balance on the camera just to get the skin tones correct. So for me, to make their life easier, I go in and pre-light a house or what, a bar, whatever it is going to be, so that I know that the skin tones are going to be exact, walking from one room to the next. Uh, you know, of course, we'll shade and add negative where we need to, but more than anything else, I want to make sure the skin tones... Negative are means kind of negative fill, like. which means you're taking away light, taking you're away creating light. more shadow. I just wanted to explain what negative is so that you... Yeah, adding light is, is a positive and taking away subtracting is a negative light. So you can, either, you can either use like cutters or flags, what we talked about earlier, which are these. This is essentially what we call a solid. This is an this is a 18 by 24 solid. This is, an, this is a negative. Like if you have uh, your key light beside you here, say your key light's on you here, and you want to... Your DP want your DP. There you go. His is bigger than mine. But say you have your your light and your DP wanted just to slow his shirt down. You add a negative to the shirt. The closer I get, the harder of an edge I'm going to get. So if I take this solid and bring it closer to the light, it's a lot more subtle. I can slow it down without really taking a lot of light off of his face. But technically, if I'm going to slow the shirt down, I wouldn't use a negative. I would use something like um, what we call singles or doubles which are scrims. So this is netting, which helps drop the light intensity down by stops, f-stops, so to say. So you would use a single to slow them down just a little bit, or a double to slow them, or, yeah, or double to slow them down even more. Uh, it all depends. A lot of times they vary, but I think technically with a single, it's a, was it stop? A stop and a half? Uh, and a doubles, double that. Always bring two. If your DP says, hey, I need a single, you bring a single and a double. If, a, if your DP asks for a full apple box, you bring them a full, a half, and a quarter, and a pancake. Yep, because you know they're going to... Because inevitably they're going to say, no, I need it lower than that, or and, I need it taller than and that. And the beauty is if you're a grip, you already got a seat when you're there. You know? Yeah, exactly. You got a place to sit on. Um, lighting, you want to jump into lighting? All right. I was brought up with the mindset of the guys that I worked with way back when. Big light in the back, little light in the front. So I always start with our back lights. I'll be your, I'll be your model. You'll be my muse. So traditionally, I always start with the back light. So what we're going to do tonight is just kind of go through. You want me to go ahead and start rolling this, Rhodes? All right, this, this is speeding. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm speeding on this one. So typically, um, when I'm on bigger productions, of course, this is just a small studio, I would have a bigger light back there. I would start with like maybe a, a Aperture 600D, an HMI or something like that. If this is my talent, they're sitting there in a the kitchen, and I want to have them sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. I'm going to have a larger light behind them that's going to be the sunlight and wash them through. Just Imagine here that we're sitting in someone's kitchen. I would have a larger light behind them, washing them through. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm just letting you know because I can't see them. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. And then I would essentially add light in front of them to go from there. So you have essentially two different properties of light. Uh, the first is direct. Who knows the most beautiful light source there is? The sun, correct. Yeah, the sun is the most pure white, the, the most pure source that we have. Its CRI, its color entering index, essentially is 100. Uh, closest to that would be tungsten. That's why tungsten has been king in the movie industry for the last century. 
Uh, underneath that, you have LEDs have gone by leaps and bounds over the last two years, which has been nuts. Um, but then you have hydrogium, which is essentially mercury. That's in HMIs, your, your, your halide metals. Um, and those yield essentially a daylight versus incandescent, which is your tungsten, which yields a 32 to 2900 degree source. But your sun is a direct source of light. So when you Most have. Most street lamps are halogen, right? Uh, mercury vapor, sodium vapor, it all depends. Yeah, sodium vapor. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of chemicals in there. Thank God it for It has to do with the way the color renders from the light. Yeah. That, that's mostly why it's important. And with LEDs, what you're seeing is you're seeing the, the charge, the photons, being supercharged over your diodes. So with an LED, you have essentially 100% light emittance from a, from a source from your cob, from your chip on board, whereas in a tungsten light, it's 80% energy and heat in 20% light, that's it. Um, HMIs were kind of the opposite. HMIs, I believe, were 80% um, light, 20% heat on the back, 20% heat and power. But with LEDs, you have 100%. So, I mean, the, the sky's the limit with LEDs. And plus, with LEDs, you've got um, Omnicolor, you've got RGB, full, full spectrum, all that stuff. But we'll, I'm just kind of going off on tangents. But we have back here, this is a, a point source. So this is a direct light. So if you want to have a seat for me real quick. Yep. So directly behind him, we have one light, and an indirect source would be something like this. This would be a bounce board that you would add to. You see the, darken, see the darkness of his face? If you would add something like this, it slowly brings up the shadows. I know it's in frame, but I kept, I kept it wide so everyone can kind of see. But it brings out the shadows inside of his face. So traditionally, opposite your backlight, you would have your key. So a lot of times you have fluctuating keys. Right now we have, this is what you call a front key. This is a front key light. This is a, yeah. This is, yeah, this is a front key light. So we have, we're going to start kind of working with a three-point setup and go from there. So you have a front key here. Uh, typically, most people do what you call a Rembrandt lighting. So what it is, it's set up at a 45-degree light. 45 degree angle to our individual here. Well, almost 45. 45 over, off x-axis, and 45 kind of up and down. So what it does is it creates a triangle underneath his eye. And it goes back to Rembrandt, back when he would do paintings. Um, you can notice a lot of the shadows, a lot of the negatives, underneath the, the short side of the individual's face. That hides the ads right there. And a lot of DPs don't like drama. So what you'll have to do sometimes is add a fill into that as well. So it can be a direct source. It can be an indirect source. It can be whatever you guys want. But the fill, like, what it does is it just brings out. Some when of he's this. referring to drama, it's the hard contrast between bright and dark. So drama typically implies that there's deep shadows. This is yielding more drama on the face itself, especially if I took the head and went further around and wrapped them over there. I'll show you. Like, what kind of effect does this give you? See if I can get. What kind of effect does this yield if I bring it off from the side? See the, neg see the negatives on his face? Yeah, that's, that's very dramatic. What if we took the light from above? It's almost very, it's menacing. It's like an interrogation. It is serial killer, you know? Can't see his face. You don't know what's going on. They've never found the bodies. Exactly. But traditionally, for just a three-point light, a, a traditional talking head, an interview, you're going to have a Rembrandt light kind of up and through here. You want to diffuse it as much as possible and go from there. If you really want to get freaky with it, you can go Frankenstein-y and have some fun. But for all practical purposes on this, We'll stick with the traditional three. It's also called the reporter sandwich, where you put the eye line in between the camera and your key, and that's typically your news style three point setup. Is you put the key next to your camera, put the producer for them to have a conversation with in between. 
Yeah. So your eye line would be on this side of your key light. Every now and then you'll see people do it opposite. There's, you know, a hundred ways you can skin a cat, but traditionally you'll have, your camera will be on the side of your key light. All right, any questions on this? Now let's get into color. Yeah, you want to talk about, let's talk about broad and short. You want to talk about it for a sec? I'll take a seat. Okay. Just depends on the air quotes, the, the what they talk about is cinematic nowadays, is they want you to shoot on the dark side of the face, right? So if you imagine where the light is on his face, now... And I'm going to have you look over here. here. Look hard here. So typically, this is considered cinematic. I'm going to keep the fill on? Yeah, keep the fill on. This is kind of a wraparound light. This is putting the dark side towards camera. He's having a conversation. Let's That's typically what is considered dramatic cinema lighting, right? Versus what we had before, which is more of a high key, traditional three point light setup. And the difference is, is instead of me giving a, a strong, clear image, what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to create that cutout. The, my backlight is creating my separation from the background. I have my fill light on the same side because I'm trying to make it feel like it's a wrapped source as opposed to a single, um, single light source there. And then if I bring this one in, hold it down, got it? Power enough. Oh, I was hitting the wrong button. Oh, okay. And now he's opening up. This is the, the broad side of my face now. He just exposed all of that. So, yeah, go ahead. It de Not all the time. Well, it, de it's a, it depends on what it's a stylistic you're concern, yeah. right? It's like I don't ever center ma center weight my compositions, but Wes Anderson always does, right? So um, now, if since I have a, a heavy key like that, I would probably where I had my eye line before, where I'm looking past the key. That's typically what you're using a high key setup as opposite of your main key. High key is, all right, low key lighting. It's very dramatic. It normally is uh, like a noir film. You, you have deep shadows. High key lighting is typically considered uh, like comedies or sitcoms or something like that where you fully light the face. It's, the point of it is not to create mystery. The point of it is to expose the image to allow you to see what you need to see. So high key normally means Generally a bright scene, low key normally means that you have areas of darkness and you're only cutting in the areas that you want to highlight. There's a lot more contrast and depth to a low key scene. Yeah. Um, where Any questions from anybody? I mean, in general, you just need to remember if you're going to set up a backlight, you're going to set up a... Uh, a a master light, the key light. Your key light is your main light. Yeah. So here to my left, actually it would be camera right, is my key light. What we have here is an Aperture 600D wrapped in a dome with a uh, double diffusion. I have a diaper on the inside, and I've got my diff in the front with a 40-degree honeycomb grid. 
You guys are more than welcome to come and take a look at all this stuff. Over here, camera left, on my right, I have an Amaran T4C, which is an omnicolor tube that is acting as my fill light coming straight in. My backlight over here is an Omnicolor Hive 100C. This is uh, essentially a point source that has gel, or excuse me, not gels, but it has lenses in front of them, kind of like HMIs. You have your stipple, your bug eye, all that stuff. You have lenses to help throw the light in a horizontal, in a horizontal or um, stippled pattern, so to say. It all, it's all about control. What it all boils down to is control. You got to remember, light moves in a direct line from the source, right? So when you put diffusion in front of a light source, you're spreading that light out. You're bending the light waves to fill the room. If you are putting anything like a Fresnel, a Fresnel is a piece of glass that allows you to focus light and normally is characterized by a slider that allows you to push it in and out. That's how you create more of a spot or a fill light. Fill normally is indicating that it's a wide cast light. And then inevitably, you work with grids. You'll eventually start working with grids, which um, you know are the checkerboard things that you see in front of lights. He's going to bring one over. So what the grid does is it makes sure you're in, you're, instead of your light bouncing all over the place, it's only going in the direction you're pointing it to. Egg crate. Egg crate, yeah. yeah. A lot of people used to call these egg crates. Um, they're just, this is a 40 degree grid. Your pattern is just spread within a 40 degree pattern. If I remove this, this soft box, it's a parabolic box, it's gonna have a nice soft beam that's gonna spread everywhere. But this helps keep the light just on the subject, just whatever it is that I wanna control. Again, it's all about control, right? Yep. Uh, any questions up to this point? Huh? Complete control. complete control, that's what you want. That's what any director wants is complete control. For me, one source is all you really need for 99% of the applications. Uh, hard, hard source, I like a big hard source. And from that, you can start to diffuse it from there. Uh, like say you're filming someone sitting on a couch. Uh, I would have couch facing camera, of course. I'd have one big light outside. That would wash over my talent, over all the foreground. And then I would use something like beadboard, something like this here, to bounce back into them, to just pull light back up into the face so it doesn't look artificial. To me, when you add a point source, when you add a source, you're adding light in there, and it, to me, it, it's, it can be unnatural if you don't do it properly. When you reflect light, it's, to me, it's more natural on a visual level. Oh, it is, it is. I carried that back from Hong Kong there. True. That's true. We're also getting into this, uh, yeah. So color rendering index. Yeah, that that came about with all I think with LEDs, maybe with CFLs when Kino kind of came into play. Yeah, basically what it is is when you're going into a space and they're using whatever practicals that they have, whatever belongs to the house that you walk into. Standard lamps that you buy from Home Depot to stick in your, your, your lamp or fill whatever office um, overhead you got, those things have no standard as far as color consistency. That's why you can go into an office space and, well, I mean, there's two reasons why, but every bulb in that office space is slightly off. So you don't really get a true single source color. You're, you're getting a mismatch of various magentas and greens coming out of those things. Not only that, they change uh, really cheap bulbs, change color temperature over cycles as they, based on as they the age. Uh, yeah, as they age and based on this cycle of power that you have because we are in a 60 hertz cycle, the, uh, the AC creates these waves of when the gases inside neon lights are, are um, excited. And so you get this color change that happens. You're like, I had it set on one thing. Why does it look green now and look blue earlier in the day? Well, it's because the lights are cycling through different colors. And, you're, and 
you're unaware of it because your eye naturally just makes up the difference. Um, your so, eye blends all the different point sources, daylight, tungsten, fluorescence. It automatically, um, just for ease of mind, it automatically kind of gives you a white tone on everything. But your camera doesn't read that way. Your camera reads color temperature. Yep. So it, it needs to know exactly what wavelengths are hitting it and in what intensity. And so what happened is back a few years ago when people were using tungsten lights and they would try and use like an incandescent bulb, their incandescent bulb would be a 2800 and most film lights were at 3200, right? That's, that's the color temperature, the warmth of the light. Now, fast forward to now where everybody's got all kinds of different sources. They may have halogen, they may have LED, they may have incandescent, you know, they, they mix and match these things. When you're going in and you're trying to color a scene with your lighting, you want to have a bulb that's going to perform consistently, and that's what CRA measures, is how consistently does it produce a given color of white. So this right here, this is, this is 2800. This is what you would call effectively a candlelight. Candlelight's roughly 2000 Kelvin. So this would be standard for essentially tungsten. Tungsten is 32. This is a 32. So this is, tungsten is 74 on the periodic table. Um, it's a, to me, I think it's a, one of the most beautiful light sources out there. It's just not, it's not economical. Um, it's a power hungry hog. And what, what LEDs have done is they have been able to take the, the properties of tungsten, the color of tungsten, and made it efficient, which is phenomenal. But going back to CRI, the color rendering index came through, and it's based upon the sun. The sun is 100%. That's all the visible light in the visible spectrum that we know about. Tungsten, once it's heated up on an incandescent scale, once it's heated up, it is a 99 CRI. So it's beautiful. And it's, that's why it's been king for 100 years. I mean, it's a beautiful source. But you can't use tungsten light outside because it's a different color temperature. So that's why they would have to add gels. They would add their CTB to bring the color temperature of tungsten to a more bluish tone. Um, so, but what CRI has done, especially now, is it's helped bring, I think, film lights to a, a much better level because there has been a lot of trash out there for years. Yeah, um, I mean, early LEDs had a problem with a what I would call a magenta spike. Yeah, that's an original light panel, uh, LP1 right there. Yeah. That light has a huge spike in there when you look at it on a daylight, on a daylight lens on your camera. And it makes skin tones look gross. Yeah. And it's, that's, you know, it's like fluorescent <laughs> lighting made skin tones look gross, so you would intentionally use it to make people look sick. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So whatever your whatever is around that is reflecting light is going to affect the color temperature perceived of your skin tone. Of your skin tone. So if you have a lot of green grass and they're standing on the green grass and there's a bright sun hitting that, that green is going to be reflected in their skin. Tone. That cast will be everywhere. You'll see it underneath the arms. Wherever or, there's a shade. You'll see it sure. where the shade, especially underneath. Yeah. The editors yeah. don't like that as much as as uh, the producers do. You know? Yeah. Um, green, screen. green screen, yeah. Green screen. That's why with green screen, a lot of people love to have just a single point um, behind them. But for me, green screen, you need to separate both sides. You need you need to wrap around light in the front, however you want to be it. If you want to do it, you know, high key, low key, whatever. If you want it flat and just broad, both sides. But I am a firm believer in separating the individual with light from both sides so that it eliminates that green cast, if possible. If not, just a little bit of light, a lot. Easier. It's a lot easier to key on the back end. A lot easier. Yeah. So what? One, one of the beauties of getting into the whole RGB spectrum and the LEDs is the, the, it, the advantages of having color at your fingertips. Uh, color evokes different moods and emotions that standard tungsten and, and daylight can't. Yeah. Modifiers can do a lot of things um, to, help, to help shape your overall subject, but color is another another tool in the gaffer's tool belt. Um, there are some shape. colors on LEDs that just don't translate to the video. You can see them with your human eye, but for some reason cameras don't like them. Um, orange is one of those that is a weird color to use on set. It, it is normally better to still use a gel for certain colors. Yeah. 
and the way you can figure that out, it, it's very camera, lens, and, and light source specific. So what I would say is if you're going to do something with color and you're planning on using an LED so you don't have to have a bunch of uh, gels that you're going to have to swap out, is you test it. I, I would do a, like a half day, come in, set it up, see how it's going to look on a subject that is similar to a texture that's going to be in your frame, and then decide whether or not you need to gel things or if you, need, if you can rely on the RGB light source. Um, and it always will bite you on the ass on set if you don't figure it out beforehand. And different skin tones need different, different gels. Um, that's what we found throughout the years. But you had a question, yes. For an LED, I wouldn't take anything over, anything under like a 91 or 92. Um, like when Dre cast, when they first hit the scene, Light panels when they hit the scene. This is, I think, that LP1 is an 84, I think is what it is on the CRI. I mean, it's horrible. But that was the standard. That was the gold standard because they got to it first. Like, ever, does anyone know what Kino flow tubes are? Kino, Kino came, to, came to the scene, uh, God, uh, 15 years ago? Jesus. Um, so they had CFLs, compact fluorescence. Laws were enacted years ago. You had to take um, all of traditional fluorescence and get rid of them, so they ended up doing the CFLs, the compact fluorescents, go from a bigger tube, to, from a T12 to a T8. Kino realized that they could capitalize on that and use housings that are built and designed for these fluorescent tubes. I mean, you had mentioned soft sources earlier. Kino tubes are soft, soft sources. Why do you have fluorescent tubes in all the warehouses? Because it's a soft source. It's very pleasing to the eye. Not from a color standpoint, but just from a soft a soft source standpoint. General illumination. From a general illumination standpoint. But Kino Flow came to, came to the scene with compact fluorescence and just and ruled it for 10 years um, because it was a beautiful light source, but the color was horrible. If you put uh, a Kino Flow up against uh, like an Aperture 600 now, um, it's, it's just ridiculous the color and the spikes you'll get. And there was no consistency with the tubes as well. And they also yielded, at, with age, they would shift color temperatures as well. Same with tungsten. As, as tungsten would age, uh, typically it would get warmer. You would go from 32, 31, 3,000 down up to, you know, sometimes even to 2,000. Same with HMIs. You know? When HMIs reach the end of their lifespan, that mercury, once it starts, once the vapors inside start to die, you'll have green spikes. You'll have magenta spikes in there. And it can just wreak havoc on an edit. Lord knows you don't want that. Oh. You mean shooting uh, with a filter on for night oh, for day? I mean that, but I was, I mean, don't have access to that. Right, yeah. I mean, night for day. I typically will just try and shoot overnight because night for day is such a huge pain in the ass. But the hard part is, is you're getting the harsh shadows of like noonday sun while you're trying to shoot a, a nighttime scene, and it's it's just always a fight. It, you know, you can always see the difference when you're looking at someone's uh, uh, like I don't know any can, old black and white film where they shot night for day. You right? can build boxes outside, but it's it's it gets really hard, especially if you're going to have a point source outside to kind of come in and either be your moonlight or be your daylight. It's really hard to build a box uh, and control all of it. Yeah, I mean, it's easier Unless you on got a car. Deep pockets. I mean, you, you can always put a car in a studio or you can always black it out or... Uh, the harder part is when I've had to try and match day for night because we've rolled into the, to the evening and so we can light we have enough daylight in our kit with every light that we have to light about this much space. Yeah, you know, uh, and we're because we're just trying to get that consistent look from the daytime. But uh, what I, the appliance that I would use now if I was doing something like that would probably be a light mat, um, just because they're you can get them three foot by four foot and they cover an entire window and you can have full control over your light source all day long, they're also thin.
so they don't you know have a whole lot of gear support to hold them up you can probably just hang them on a nail outside the house um, and then that way you can control exactly how much sun is you can drop divotine or something behind it a lot of people um, if you don't have access to divotine or furniture pads you can go buy contractors bags we've used those in the past cut contractors bags use gaff tape pay for tape preferably and just put those outside of your source especially if you're using a light mat then put some shears on the inside so it helps diffuse the light even more so it looks more like sunlight. Yeah. Yeah. Just no, dial up sunlight on the LED. I'd you mean as far as purchasing equipment or experimenting? I'd say go to a studio here that's that's busy and ask yeah. to just just walk on set. Say hey, I'd say be, I want to be a grip PA. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to help help you out. I want to learn. It's just you know, you need to prove yourself to be eager, uh, eager to learn, and also you're not going to drop lights and eager to work. Yeah. Did you say go to networking events? Go, go to networking events. Yeah, you got to come to networking. Particularly event. if you want to go to what is it? Film to. Film bar. film bar. Film bar Monday. Go to, yeah, go to every Film Bar Monday, and eventually you'll find a job. It'll magic into your Exactly, inbox. exactly. I guess end game for all the Film Bar kids is the, I'd love to do a movie with every one of you guys. I think that would be fantastic. There's a lot of people here that are actors. We got voice talent. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, you know, when you're talking about light color, uh-huh. um, I would presume that you would have light you have uh, color meters, which you'll, you can use to register the exact wavelengths that it's, that's, that's being hit or emitted, for that, for that matter. Um, and then you just you go and hit each source. But and then if, depending on the camera you're using, like red cameras have red, have a red green, uh, blue light indication system for false color to let you know where your hot spots are and, and stuff like that. You have histograms on camera. That can uh, you can set up a histogram that it's a, an RGB histogram, uh, and that will give you an idea of how your color temperatures are playing on on people. Um, you have um, in editing software typically you have a different set of tools that will break things out into CMYK color even, um, which is a is a print based color. Yeah, um, so there, there are a lot of tools, and a lot of them are built into monitors now or built into cameras. Um, the spot meter he's talking about, or a color meter, um, those are very specific tools, and they are not cheap. Uh, so that's something that you would buy if you are a gaffer, and you are, and that's literally all you're going to do. A lot um, of times, it, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I'm like, so it is difficult. It's not like when I first started, I would buy a $300 Sectronic uh, light meter that could do direct source and incident source, um, and then can pretty much get by. Nowadays, the spot meters are very expensive, and most people are not. You, you don't get paid to have a spot meter on set. It's something you do out as a professional bit of pride and truly understanding the science of lighting. Um, so that's why you would purchase something like that. It, it's, it's one of those things that if you have that in your tool bag, good for you, but it doesn't mean I hire you, right? It just means that you know what you're doing. And a lot of times, like on sets now, you'll have a lighting designer who works in tandem with your DP and your gaffer, and that individual is responsible for all your lights. So like these lights that I have around you guys in the corners, all of these, your lighting designer will have access to all these lights. So they can control the intensity, they could control everything as well, from 3,200 degrees Kelvin to 56. So your lighting designer will, will regulate color temperature as well. So once your gaffer and your electricians get all of the lights set, a lot of times your LD will sit there and he'll say, well, look, I want, you know, I want less, you know, come down 10 clicks on number one, come down 10 clicks on your key, you know, go up 10 on your back. So your lighting designer will go in and, and dial in specific colors as well. That's just a, but if you have a lighting designer on set, then I need to start working for you. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I've used them. Uh, I, I like them. They're nice and convenient. Uh, the answer is 
I mean, horses for courses, is it good enough to get you 80% of what you need done? And are you working on something where 100% is where you get paid? You know what I mean? Like if you're working on a project where the advertising agency wants the blue to be the brand blue, and if it doesn't look like brand blue on monitor, then no, I would definitely have a color spot meter and I would be charging them $10,000 a day. And so and if I'm charging them $10,000 a day with the shit that I have, I better have that, that color yeah. dialed in. Then you also have to take into consideration your, your camera sensor, yes. your monitors, They're, everything is not gonna be the true color that you really want it to be. Digital we can try is and get the only there. digital uh, LED company that formulates their LED lights for camera sensors, and they will give you a breakdown if you're using a red camera of this make and year, then this is the correct red that belongs to that. Um, but those are like lighting appliances that they're using in Star Wars, and they start at $6,000 a, a, a head unit, and you can string a bunch of head units, you know, like, like you got to understand budget and who you're going to get paid to do the work for should drive your gear choices. I mean, you can do it out of pride, but you'll be broke and you'll have a bunch of really cool equipment that you won't see work. Yes. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll I would, go, we'll I would, I would drop week. money on Digital Sputnik today and then tomorrow they'll be out of business and they won't repair your equipment. Go ahead. Are there different cameras? Like given the color sensor? All on certain colors? Or not? Like when you're coming. Oh, Nikon, Nikon always has problems with reds. It's hard for a Nikon camera. I don't, not many people shoot with Nikons. I'm back from my stills days. I have Nikon bodies. Um, Nikon has always had a hard time processing reds. Uh, Yeah, all the greens and blues, but they've always had issues with reds. Uh, Canon, the Canon 5D Mark IV, one of my favorite cameras for skin tones of all time. That sensor was just gorgeous. Um, to me, I think cameras are interchangeable. Um, you can any more? Any, yeah. I mean, I've worked with FS7s that, if they're tuned properly, can look like Ari's. You know, so it, it all just depends on the level of talent and the ability to see color what you can get out of a camera. But any more, especially with RAW, I mean, a camera is a camera is a camera. What matters is does it work for you professionally, right? Does it do what you need it to do? And that's the choice that you make. You know, I, I have $10,000. I can buy a red body and no cards and, you know, and, and throw some kind of lens on the front of that. And if that works for you, then rock on. Otherwise, get a DSLR. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so a camera's going to capture light, and so you need a lighting guy to light it. Light it. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you guys for speaking. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Uh, obviously, now we just kind of hang out, so if you have any more questions for them, feel free to question them. Yeah, if y'all want to play with lights, too, yeah. come on. And, yeah.